Welcome. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the inter, uh, this uh, IIEA event uh, for both our audience here today, which is, uh, which is a big audience, and our uh, audience online via Zoom. Uh, I will be chairing today's event. My name is Alex Dukalski. I'm an associate professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin, uh, and I direct the UCD Center for Asia Pacific Research. And you can tell from my accent, I'm a native of the country that we will be trying to uh, better understand today. Uh, we're very, don't plan on it, All right? <laughs> Maybe we'll be more confused by the end. Uh, I, uh, we're delighted uh, to be joined today by Frank Luntz, who, uh, as you know, uh, is a leading American pollster, advisor, and commentator, who has been generous enough to take time out of his uh, schedule to speak with us today. Uh, Frank is going to speak with, uh, with us for just a few minutes, I think, of relatively short remarks, uh, and he has uh, indicated that he wants engagement. So uh, be, be ready with your questions, I think, is, is, the, is the message. Uh, you'll be able to indicate that you wish to ask questions, of course, by raising your hand if you're here in the room, or if you're on Zoom using the Q&A function, and I'll be able to see those questions here. Uh, a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Uh, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Frank and then hand it over to him for his remarks. Frank Luntz is amongst the highest profile uh, uh, political pollsters and commentators in the United States. His instant response focus group technique has been profiled on 60 Minutes, Good Morning America, and PBS's award-winning Frontline. He has been a guest in most of the United States' leading media outlets, and he has written for, among others, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Financial Times, The Los Angeles Times, at uh, Times of London, and The Washington Post. Newspapers, the word times in it, I probably would. Yes. <laughs> uh, Frank has also worked for more than 50 Fortune 500 companies and CEOs, and is the past winner of the Washington Post's uh, Crystal Ball Award for being the most accurate pundit. Uh, with that, we'll hand it over to Frank, and uh, uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to Dublin. So I apologize for being American at this point <laughs> for so many reasons, but one of them is that I prefer conversation rather than lecturing. I did go to school at, or I went to university at Oxford and my tutor would speak for 15 or 20 minutes before I could utter a single word. That's what I'm told education was to be about. It was not a fun experience for me. It's so strange that I go back to Oxford now as a guest lecturer and I love it. And as a student, I absolutely hated it. I was so looking forward to it, but I had the mistaken belief that Margaret Thatcher was the greatest prime minister since Winston Churchill, and Ronald Reagan was the greatest president since Lincoln. And the fact that on the very first day I was there, I wore a T-shirt of Thatcher and Reagan hugging each other made me the most unpopular person at Trinity College, and I never overcame that in the three years that I was there. But thank God I've got the defil uh, from it, and, uh, and it changed my life. I'm sorry for America for three reasons, and then we'll do a um, conversation. Number one, I'm sorry that we are so loud and, and so angry. 73% of Americans are, and I quote, mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. That's a line from the movie Network, and every single year I ask the same question, and the numbers get worse and worse. Briefly under Barack Obama, it was a little bit less agitation, but we're angry at a broken economy that has made a lot of promises that it hasn't delivered. We're angry at a political system that seems to reward the loudest rather than those who deserve the most. We're angry at a media that doesn't seem to, in our perspective, tell us what we need to know. We're angry at culture for making us so disrespectful to each other. And that level of anger boils over so often now, and it makes it hard to govern, makes it hard to plan for the future. It's frightening to me. And it's one of the reasons why I spend two months or three months or four months a year in Europe. That will be the source of ridicule. Just that comment will be the source of ridicule. But you know what? It's quieter here. It's a little bit easier here. Your taxes are too high. Your regulation is too much, and yet I like it here, and I really, and I really do. Second, 
is that we have two candidates right now the public doesn't want, and yet they're prohibitive favorites to be the nominees, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. On the Democratic side, Democrats, not voters, Democrats believe that Joe Biden's too old. He's already 80 years old. And I want to put this in perspective. He's not running for election just a year and a half from now. You're asking, or he's asking, for Americans to vote for him for five and a half years from now. He was in this country. You saw him. You listened to him. He's an incredibly decent guy. I've known him now for about 25 years. I taught his son at Penn. As a human being, he's one of the best. As a president, he is 80, and he shows every element of that age. And that's the easier one. Trump is out of control. There are no limits to what he will say. There are no facts that he will deny, that he won't deny. It's really difficult. And I wrote something for the New York Times and took a little bit of heat for it from Republicans and some from Democrats. The administration wasn't a bad administration. Our unemployment, which they said could not get as low as it got, the lowest African-American employment rate ever, the lowest Latino unemployment rate for decades, an economy that was absolutely humming, a deficit and debt that was way too big, way too big, but nothing compared to what it is right now, a border that was under control, compared to right now where it's chaos down on, on the, uh, between Texas and Mexico. Crime that was under control is not now in New York. I have to say to you, I bet many of you have, I have relatives who live in New York. It's not safe. Philadelphia is not safe. Washington, D.C. is iffy. Chicago's a mess. Atlanta, Los Angeles. There was a lot to the Trump administration that was successful, but to his demeanor, to how he speaks to people and treats people and the impact that that had on how we relate to each other is horrific. And it's something that we're dealing with every single day and we will for, for years to come. Even if he should decide not to run, which he's, obviously he's running. And by the way, to, to put this in perspective, our economy's gotten a little bit better over the last six months. Inflation has somewhat subsided, although it was out of control for a while. Whatever you think of Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Donald Trump is beating Joe Biden right now in virtually every single respectable survey. So before you dismiss Trump as an extremist, which Europeans do so much, before you dismiss him for even beyond what I've said about him, he is winning. Because the public does not want another four years of this. Or looking into the future, they don't think it'll be any better. And the third thing is about our institutions and about the public's loss of faith and trust and confidence. Everything that I do in my life is the relentless pursuit of the truth. Everything. So I've been re-examining where I stand on immigration, climate, um, COVID, affirmative action, which you guys, I believe, call positive discrimination over here, which is a very interesting term. No side has a monopoly on the truth. Nobody does. And I've been at this now for over 35 years. I was looking at my list of countries. I've been to over 40 countries. I've met with more than a dozen world leaders. I've read close to a thousand books. I think I'm a bit shy of that. And I'm changing my point of view all the time now, trying to get at what is the right answer for the problem that we face at that moment. And in academia, I am confronted with students who haven't been to any country, haven't met a single world leader, 
barely read because they're on social media and they tell me with such assertiveness that they're right and I'm wrong. I don't want to have a woke battle in my country, in your country, in Europe, because if you do, you may win an election, but you will destroy the country in the process. The moment that we see each other by what race we are, by what gender we are, by, by things that we cannot change, and we're judging them that I'm guilty for some crime that was committed 170 years ago, and that's the case, there is no common ground. There is no solution. When my students don't want to hear an alternative point of view because they're so sure they're right, then we got a problem. Then we got a crisis. And that's what's happening right now in the country. And yet, we do have to find a way to live together. We do have to do a better job of reaching out. The right is so dismissive of the left, but the left is equally as dismissive of the right. Take responsibility for your own side. Speak up against your own side. We don't do it. We'll sit there and say, well, as soon as those guys will stop wrecking the country, we'll start listening. No, we have to look inward and we have to say, okay, we got it wrong. And that is, Donald Trump is incapable of doing that. He's incapable of saying, I made a mistake. He will not do it. But guess what? So is Joe Biden. He does it more nicely. He does it in a way that's less argumentative or less offensive, but he's no less determined that he's right and everyone else is wrong. And the reason why I raise this is we have a debt ceiling crisis that's coming days from now. And Joe Biden will not compromise. Joe Biden would not even negotiate. So I've heard all the Trump stuff. I'm an anti-Trump, I shouldn't say that. I am a, I have no problem holding Donald Trump accountable. We have to do the same thing with Joe Biden. Because if we default, you're all gonna feel it here in Ireland. You're gonna feel it all across Europe. If we mess up in America, the whole world gets messed up. That's my opening. Okay, my guess is there are some questions. <laughs> so uh, I would remind you that the Q&A is on the record. Uh, and I would ask you to identify yourself uh, briefly and keep your comment, uh, keep your question up relatively succinct and not a not a long. And we want narrative. your bank account information. We want your social security number. <laughs> we want to know where to find you and where to send the government car to pick you up and remove you from society. <laughs> but on that sure. note, with that in the back. I I was listening to you talking to that good commentator across the sea, Andrew Marr, the other evening, and you, I, I was, I certainly scared me, and it scared him. You said they were only one election away from literally, literal Armageddon, you know, because of the way the political conversation has gone, the use of social me, me, media, all this unpleasantness to each other, that this is what is going to lead to some kind of Armageddon. So you might comment on that because I don't think that was explored that much in that particularly short interval with him. And one other question with your permission, Chairman. Suppose um, um, DeSantos wins the Republican nomination and uh, then, then Trump will run as an independent and then you could have a three-way horse race in the, in the presidential election. Would you like to be putting on your punter's hat uh, you know, sorting that out or commenting on what might happen. So once again, I've said this before, the Irish speak English the best of any English speaking country of all. You just asked a couple of really tough questions, but you did it in such a beautiful way. It I mean, sounds so lyrical <laughs> that I could just like close my eyes and listen to it forever. No wonder you guys are such good writers and, and poets and, and communicators. On the second part, the reason why it will not work is that a whole bunch of states have a sore loser law, which means if you run for president or if you run for office in a political party, you cannot then declare yourself independent. They will not give you a line. So Trump could seek to run, but he would be denied the ballot in dozens of states. So that 
that won't happen. Secondly, DeSantis, I believe, absolutely beats Joe Biden. In fact, I think every Republican beats Joe Biden other than Donald Trump. But I should not be so declarative because Trump is winning right now. And he's beating every other Republican by, by miles. When he was, when they went into Mar-a-Lago and they searched his place, his numbers went up. When he was indicted for uh, improper uh, payments, he was, his numbers went up. When he was found gu guilty of sexual assault, his numbers went up. Every time he is attacked, his numbers go up. And it's not just about being a victim. He's convinced his supporters and many others that he's being prosecuted and persecuted. And he just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's part of the, my answer to your first question. And by the way, I'm old. Just give me, I'm not as old as everyone here, but I'm old. Just give me one question so I can, so I'm sure that I actually answer it. The reason why I'm so afraid is because I don't see a solution to this. I see two candidates running, and I know that 73% of Americans do not want a rematch of 2020. They don't want these two people. A majority of both Republic, a majority of Republicans don't want Trump to run again. But among those who do, he has such solid support. A majority of Democrats don't want Joe Biden to run. But among those that do, such solid support. The reason why I'm, and I didn't use the word Armageddon, that's either your word or Andrew Marr's word, but, but well, I, but I, I'm a man of words, actually, even though I've got a really lousy vocabulary, and even though I can't spell at all, thank God for spell check. In fact, whoever invented spell check deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. I believe that with each election cycle, we come closer to losing that element of democracy that we all celebrate. Free, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to make mistakes, freedom to try again, freedom of opportunity. I'm doing a project right now for the Center for Policy Studies in London, one of the most significant think tanks on the language of freedom. Because in the UK, we're not sure that freedom matters. I mean, it matters, but fairness seems to matter more than freedom. And I'm gonna actually ask you that question one second. In the States, freedom's the number one value. Uh, equality would be number two, but the distance would be very wide. In the UK, fairness is the number one value and it's over freedom. I'm curious just about this crowd here. Which is a higher value to you? Which matters more to, to you? and to Ireland itself, freedom or fairness. If you had to choose, would you, which would you prioritize? Who would say freedom? I didn't ask for a comment, I asked for hands. <laughs> you must be a journalist. Who would say freedom? And who would say fairness? So the cameras can't record it, but it's overwhelming for fairness here, overwhelming. Which is called drudgery. Which is an unavowed cousin of the other two. It might be surprisingly successful as a candidate if we're to run. Be grudgery. That's a good word. That's a great. Word. I have a question here. Yep. Uh, hi, Sarah Carey, Irish Independent. Other than dying, um, is there any circumstance under which Biden is not the candidate? Is there any chance of a contest? No, because the only Democrat who's challenging him, there's a spiritual healer <laughs> who is involved in the race and she'll get her three or 4%. And these are people who basically cha cha channel Oscar Wilde on nights, weekends, and that like Christmas day. Uh, and then there's Robert Kennedy Jr. who is nothing like his namesake. And he'll get 15% of the vote, but it's nothing significant. So Joe Biden is going to be the Democrat, unless unless he decides not to run. And he's way behind on fundraising compared to Barack Obama, way behind on organization compared to Barack Obama when Obama sought re-election. 
So there's something in my head that thinks that he's doing this simply because he doesn't want to become a lame duck. And that in October or November, he'll say, okay, I've thought about it and I really should not be a candidate. No one agrees with me on this, but I do think it's a possibility. And then chaos. Uh, you have the vice president. Uh, some of you have heard me before that the problem with Vice President Harris is that she's got the lowest approval rating since Dan Quayle, and Dan Quayle's got the lowest approval rating since Aaron Burr. Now, if, you, if you've seen Hamilton, you'll get the joke. I should not tell it in a foreign country because Americans don't know it. But she's a very flawed candidate. Uh, a much less flawed candidate is the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, who already has a nationwide fundraising base, has been running, obviously, the biggest state with the most money of any in the country. You have Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan for Democrats who desperately want a female to be leading their party. Uh, Cory Booker, for those who are interested in um, the African-American population, incredible speaker, visionary and a real unifier, Senator from New Jersey, and Mitch Landrew, who is the former uh, mayor of New Orleans, Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, and now in charge of the president's infrastructure package. Best retail politician I've ever met on either side. And the one person we haven't talked about, so I'm giving you all these names, so you should write them down and look and go and YouTube them and see what you think, is Joe Manchin as a possible independent candidate. And I think Joe Manchin has real potential. He's not made a public decision whether or not to run. I don't know whether he will. He's from West Virginia, governor. He was a governor, he's now a senator. Held up much of Joe Biden's legislation because he felt it was spending way too much money. And as it turns out, he, he was the first senator to say, wait a minute, this is going to trigger inflation. We see, I'll see what happened. Um, I, he would start with 15% of the vote, which is a high watermark for an independent. And I believe he's got the potential to double that. If he runs with Trump and Biden as the two party nominees, does his decision to run as an independent guarantee a second Trump presidency? No. And everyone asked me the same question. If you actually look at the polling, because Joe Manchin, even though he's a Democrat, he opposed the Biden administration on some of their signature legislation. So Democrats don't like him. He actually draws more votes from Republicans than does Democrats. It, Joe Manchin is a safe vote for Republicans who don't like Donald Trump much more than he's a safe vote for Democrats who don't like Joe Biden. He takes 2.2 votes from the Democrats for every one vote. Sorry, I want to say it right. He takes 2.2 votes from every Republican for every one vote he takes from the Democrats. So right now, the Republicans should be doing everything they can to keep him off the ballot because he's a threat to Trump much more than a threat to Joe Biden. Okay, we have a question on Zoom from Ellen Hazelcorn. Uh, she asks, you have focused on Where's Trump. from? Doesn't say. Zoom. Um, she lives in a country called Zoom. <laughs> uh, you have focused on Trump, she says. Uh, what are your views on DeSantis, who appears to be running on a culture war platform? Uh, and of course, you were, I believe, on BBC yesterday uh, commenting on uh, DeSantis's, uh, shall we say, a shambolic, uh, at least uh, from the public perception, uh, campaign launch. I know that it's significant when I've got members of the European Parliament coming up to me and say and asking me, how can someone who can't launch for president? There are two days that you control everything, and only two days, two speeches, your campaign launch and your convention speech when you get the nomination. Everything else is up to the press, up to your opponent. And on the very first day that you control everything, you can't get it right. And they're asking me, how can he possibly be president? And there are people on the right of the spectrum in politics in Europe who are horrified by what happened. And I said to them, it really doesn't matter. Ron DeSantis is not going to lose a single vote because he had a bad announcement. That said, 
I mean, what the hell? People should be fired for that. Uh, now, on the bright side, he raised $8 million in 24 hours. $8 million. So the announcement may have gone really badly, but $8 million in one, that's your entire campaign for prime minister, all the parties, is what he did in one day. Um, I'm very nervous about the culture war stuff because it will get him elected if he's the nominee. Culture war at this moment, talking about how people are being ignored or forgotten. Uh, cancel culture at universities. I don't know what's happened here in Ireland. I know what's happening in the UK and the US. But the sense that you can, can no longer say what you think or what you feel. I felt that way. I had to be careful. And eventually I got, I got sick. And when I didn't die, I realized I can say anything I want. It doesn't actually matter. But there are academics who don't want to voice a right of center point of view in a left of center university because they won't get tenure. You go through the American universities from all the way from Boston down south and go all the way west to California. Not many conservatives in academia with tenure. And that's not by accident. There's a reason for that. There's not that many students that feel comfortable joining college Republicans. So is there a market for this? Absolutely. Is it good for the country? No way. And I say this to those who want to wage this kind of campaign. You will wreck your country if you do. I, if I identify you as a white male and I go back to something that you all did, the Catholic and Protestant, this country is fraught with that. It's what makes people so nervous about Brexit and the Irish agreement. And it's so fascinating to me because I'm an outsider and everyone I talk to, the moment I've been with them for 10 minutes, they tell me, we haven't really, really, in fact, I'm gonna ask you, have you really solved the Irish issue? I did not know this. I thought this is peace. I thought everyone now gets along. I spend time in the North. They're not killing each other anymore, but they don't love each other. They don't like each other. They don't respect each other. I'm a cab ride to, from uh, the airport to Belfast. I had a Protestant cab driver tell me in explicit detail what had happened to his family, and it's horrific. And on my ride back, I had a Catholic cab driver tell me what had happened to his family by the Protestants. There was so much death and so much violence and so much ugliness. And it wasn't always this way. But once it gets into your system, you never get it out. Don't go woke. It isn't worth it. I would rather lose a campaign than lose a country. Okay, we have a question here. Um, Thank you, Brian. You're My standing name. up. I am, yeah, out of respect for you. My name is- I'm Barry frightened Cooper. now. <laughs> When, it, when people ask a question sitting down, it's easy. When they ask a question standing up, I know, but I'm thankful because in this country, you don't have guns like we do. Because if they stand up in America, I'm waiting for something worse to happen. Yeah. I'm not going to throw the mic at you, I promise. It was just so the people at the back can see. So my <laughs> name is Barry Colfer. I'm the director of research here at the Institute. So thanks a lot for being with us. The Biden administration has provided enormous support to Ukraine following Russia's invasion of that country. Um, can you say anything about what any candidate or party might say with respect to relations with Ukraine and Russia, given the president's President Trump's prox proximity to the Kremlin in the past? Yes. In advance of any election. Thanks. Uh, uh, great question. And here's where the reporting isn't really accurate. And I'll give you an example. Republicans want an accounting. I mean, whenever I say Republican, I'm using it from the American perspective. Republicans want an accounting where the money's going because it's a lot. First thing you need to know is of the 75 billion that's been spent, 65 has gone to American companies, American efforts. They're not dumping money into Ukraine. They're, it is used to purchase the weapons that Ukraine uses to defend itself. 
then you have Donald, so second thing is that Donald Trump says it's been $170 billion. His numbers aren't right. <laughs> Mr. President, whoever your camera is, I think is right there. Your numbers aren't right. If you can't even know that number, what the hell did you do over the last seven years? Didn't you learn something from it? Number three, he did. Trump did refuse to say that he wants a Ukrainian victory. There are about 221 House Republicans. At least 200 of them would look you straight in the eye and say, we want a Ukrainian victory. Are there some who don't? A few. And they're going to be highlighted. They're going to be celebrated by those who are trying to cause dissent. There are a few. And I remind people that Donald Trump was telling the world that Putin was the most amazing global leader, the most, the most uh, admirable individual, how smart he is to have invaded Ukraine. And I say this whenever I can. I know that some people are watching. Just go back to the video because you can't change a video. You can get your numbers wrong. You can deny that you assaulted someone. You can say that you're being a victim. It's in right, uh, writing. It's on the record. It's in video. Donald Trump said that Putin, Putin is brilliant. No, he's not. He's a mass murderer. What he's doing in Ukraine is a disgrace. It's a crime against humanity. I know that there's specific definitions of genocide, so I don't use that word but he's trying to inflict as much pain and suffering on an independent, sovereign nation as he possibly can. And that would be a message to every European. If he would do it to Ukraine, and he did it to Georgia, he's done it to other countries, he'll do it to yours if you're not careful. I do not blame Russia. I blame Vladimir Putin. And 72% of Americans support Biden's efforts, 18% of Americans oppose it, and the rest don't pay attention or are undecided. That number will drop into the mid-60s by the end of this year because Americans don't like protracted conflict. And in the end, they get tired, and they're going to start to say the money should be spent here and not there, again, not knowing that it's actually being spent in the U.S., but when Zelensky said, I don't need a plane, I need, I need weapons, it wasn't quite Churchillian, but it was pretty damn close. And if there's one human being, if you ask me who's the human being I want to meet most, it's him. And I know some people who could introduce us. The problem is I would just break down in front of him because he's such a hero to me. Although he does need to change his outfit from time to time. We get the point that he wears the, the, the green. I just hope that he's got 28 of them and it's not the same one every single day. Okay. Uh, Hannah DC, IIA Communications Director. Um, I'm interested in your perspective on how um, AI is going to impact polling. How about, how about the impact of AI on life? Well, but specifically on polling and what regulation might be needed to protect democracy. Um, we're, we're not going to know whether it's, it's, they've done it to me. There's a presentation by the person who I think is the most brilliant at trying to warn us of the potential threat. He was in the social dilemma, uh, Tristan Harris. He was originally an ethicist for Google, and now he, he leads an organization that's dedicated to studying these issues. They created an AI of me with my voice and my face saying the most ridiculous stuff. And you actually can't tell the difference. Now, maybe it is me. Maybe <laughs> I am saying the most ridiculous stuff. But by this time next year, we're not going to know whether Donald Trump actually said something. Because, by the way, his stuff often sounds like it was... It, 10 years ago, he sounded like he was being AI'd. And that's a real problem because we already don't know what to trust. And I know from the research that we did that the people who are most likely to believe in 
conspiracy theories are most likely to be on the web, are most likely to be sharing posts on the web on average more than uh, more than three a week, are most likely to believe that COVID wasn't real, least likely to wear a mask, least likely to be vaccinated, all the things that we don't want in life, that we don't want for society, it's all wrapped together. And AI is going to turbocharge that. So I am very much afraid of what it does to the electoral process. You can't distinguish fact from fiction. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. When your kids don't talk to you anymore, when you, I don't know who's got, who's got kids between the ages of, say, 10 and 18, it's warping. Social media right now is warping their brains. It's making them uncommunicative. It's changing their sleep patterns. It's changing their health. It's having so much of an impact on their condition as human beings. And yet the politicians do nothing about it because they're afraid to do something wrong. Well, we're losing in America. We're, I don't know if the number's are appropriate, but we're losing thousands of kids a day who go over the edge, who start to get on their cell phones at 11 p.m. at night, pull the covers over their heads, and are on social media for the next two hours, get up at 5.30 in the morning just to see how many likes they got the night before, where they actually cannot talk to their teachers. They cannot talk to each other. They have to do it through their phones. Every single day, we lose another set of them and no one's doing anything about it. it. It angers me more than just about anything. Okay, we have- I'm really depressing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, this one's not gonna get any better. <laughs> um, uh, we have no, a question- I'm, from, like I'm depressing uh, myself. Somebody think of an optimistic question for the last one and we'll hopefully end the afternoon on a, on a high note. Uh, we have a question from Ethna McDermott, who is an IIEA member. She asks, could you please share your thoughts on the position of the rights of women in the United States in the wake of the repeal of Roe versus Wade? Uh, are women more likely to turn out in large numbers, numbers to vote for Democratic candidates? Yes, they are. We saw this in 2022. The turnout was significant among younger women in particular. 18 and 29-year-olds don't vote in off-year elections, in midterm elections. But they came out this time. Republicans were supposed to win a whole lot of seats in a lot of suburbs. There was the people guessing they would gain 15 to 20 seats and uh, have a 15 to 20 seat majority in Congress. The majority turned out to be five. And it was a, a dismal success. Still more people voted Republican than Democrat. The Republicans got 51% in the House races, Democrats 48 but it should have been much wider. And the, and the difference was both abortion and Trump. And younger voters in particular, female voters in particular, said, this is not what I want. So these issues do matter. And arguably, it will be very hard for a Republican. <coughs> Sanders in Florida put out legislation and you have six weeks to have that decision about abortion, and there are a whole lot of Republican women who are furious. Does it help you get the nomination? Absolutely. Does it hurt you, if not kill you in the general election? Absolutely. And what is happening in the Republican, by the way, Democrats don't handle this issue that well either, because you've got legislation that's supported by the House that allows abortion in virtually any circumstance up to any point of the pregnancy. Americans don't want that either. There's a common ground, rape, incest, the life of the mother. And at a certain point, which is around 20 weeks, the public believes that that's the common ground. Anything later than that, and it becomes a serious moral issue. Anything that limits it even more becomes a serious health issue and a woman's rights issue. So there is that common ground. Democrats in the House went way beyond that in their legislation. Republicans in response went way beyond that common sense position. And if Republicans don't find a more common ground, it's going to hurt them next, next November. Okay, we have a question in the back here. 
and then yeah. yep yes in the back here yeah I hope they pay you a lot of money to do. You should unionize. My care. <laughs> there should be a union for my carriers in public. Uh, presentation. I, I think so. I was going to ask that, but I have to restrict to one question, don't I? Uh, Paul Turpin, I'm a member of the Institute. I kind of hang around boardrooms now, but way back, I suppose, I did degrees in economics. And not long after that, um, I don't know if it was Carter or no, yeah, Clinton talked about it's the economy stupid. So I'm saying, I'm wondering, have things changed dramatically? Because in your opening remarks, you referred to the fact that the economy is humming. Not humming, no, no. It's better now than it was. It's not humming. But the Democrats were not punished for inflation. They, the Republicans failed to pick up the House, failed to pick up the Senate, only picked up a few seats, maybe 10 seats in the House. Okay. No, I think it's, but it's, I, I'm just wondering, is the economy so strong? And one thing that I, that occurs, obviously, is it, it appears that there is a greater level of inequality. You know, for example, um, if Jeff Bezos was to relocate to Ireland, our average incomes would rise dramatically, but I wouldn't feel any better about it. And I'm wondering, is that's what, you know, is the inequality one of the big differences when you have an economy that's going reasonably well, and yet you have 73% of people mad as hell. Uh, that issue is arguably the number one issue among Democrats, income inequality. And that's why the business community is suffering right now an image deterioration, even though so many people are employed. The public does not evaluate the economy by employment as it once did. It now evaluates the economy by affordability. And things are just not affordable for the middle class anymore. And over, so in the US, it's petrol and it's food. Over here, it's housing. And young people in their 30s can even afford to own their own home. The feeling is that the rich get richer the poor stay poor and the middle class is slipping. And that's creating much of the anger. Up until 2016, those people voted Democrat. In 2016, a whole lot of working class voters, white working class, switched to the Republican Party, switched to Donald Trump, not the Republican Party. They specifically voted for Trump. They felt ignored, they felt forgotten, and they even felt betrayed. And the and they were really angry because Barack Obama had a program for New York City. He had a program for Philadelphia, for Atlanta, for Chicago. They had no program for Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia. The angriest people in America right now are in the Rust Belt or in rural areas where they see all the programs and all the benefits and everything going to the biggest cities in America, and they see nothing coming to them. No hope, no opportunity. And a lot of those people who had voted Democrat up to that point switched. Union membership was overwhelmingly Democratic until 2016. And in fact, some of the unions would not endorse because they did not want to cause an uprising among their own membership. When you go to a Trump rally now, which I do attend, they're filled with union members, working class voters that will tell you they voted Democrat until 2016 and have stayed with Trump. So yes, income inequality is significant. It's a reason why people do not feel better off, even though the numbers have improved. And frankly, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, when it becomes impossible to put the food on the table that you want, or you can't afford to drive to your sister's house two hours away because the gas is too expensive, that made voters furious. And they did blame the Biden administration. But then you have to ask yourself, why didn't more Republicans win in 2022? And the answer, abortion and Donald Trump. Okay, I have a question in the back. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Derry Fitzgerald, uh, I'm a member of the Institute, and I'm going to take you back down the pessimistic road again and, <laughs> and, and talk about, well, I suppose, NATO and the Ukraine war. Uh, one, of the, one of the fears of many uh, member states is that the US would withdraw from NATO uh, with the Trump re-election coming back. Um, bearing in mind the capacity of America to support Ukraine, um, is that much greater than any of the European member states to support it? And the industrial base that's based in America as against what's based in Europe. How real do you think this threat is for Donald Trump's withdrawal from NATO? I can't imagine it, but I couldn't imagine January 6th. I couldn't imagine election night 2020, I've learned not to say never because things that were impossible have now happened and not in the positive way, in the negative way. Uh, there would be so much opposition in Congress by Republicans and Democrats alike that he, what he could end up doing is slashing the budget, the contribution as he did with the United Nations but actually leaving, abandoning, abandoning NATO, I can't, it's not conceivable. But breaking into the Capitol, I mean, I was, I was interviewed by Canadian Broadcasting and the reporter kept pushing me, pushing me, prodding me, poking me. She got what she wanted. It was not my America. January 6th was so embarrassing and so inexcusable. And I'm glad that those people are not being held accountable. Thank God I live in a country where you break the law. You try to upset. It's okay to upset the political system. It's okay to protest. It's even welcomed. But you try to bring down the government. I'm glad that those people are held accountable for it. Okay, we have a question from Zoom and then we'll, then we'll come here. Um, we have a question from Nora Owen, IIEA board member. Will border control slash migration from Mexico be a major electoral issue? Yes. And it will be because it's going to get violent. People are pushing harder and harder. The expected huge wave that we thought would come when the laws changed did not happen. But there are many in the Democratic Party that don't believe that that border should be adhered to. And that's a culture war component. There really is a difference between Republicans and Democrats and immigration. And there's a solution. Build, I'll give you, and I'll give you the, the numbers and the components to it. Build some sort of barrier where it makes sense, number one. Number two, immediately accept the DREAM Act for kids who are brought to this country through no fault of their own. And third, make legal immigration easier to achieve. The combination of those three, which seems to make sense, is 80% support. I mean, it's remarkable. However, right across the channel or whatever, what is the sea? Irish Sea? Britain, just yesterday, they announced they've got the highest level of immigration. And even labor voters are angry at this. Actually, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. All voters are angry at this because it's not the way that we want the world to move. We want it to be orderly. We want it to be legal. We want integration. Clearly what happened in France was not a success. You can't tell me that the immigration to France strengthened the French society, the French culture, the French economy, because those people were never integrated. And now you have way too much violence, way too much division, and there are whole communities where it's just immigrants. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It, it may not be a melting pot. It may not be a mixing pot. But there has to be acceptance. And there has to be understanding and empathy. And it has not happened in that country. And you don't want that here either. Good afternoon, Una Ryder, a member of the Institute. Um, 
just listening to the talk and trying to bring us back to the positive, I'm reminded of Barack Obama's campaign on the theme of hope. What gives you hope for the future? I have certain, but I used to say I don't have any. And then I realized that my audience really didn't want to hear that. So I just made stuff up. Uh, I will say that, and, and my friends all think it's funny. Like they, they make fun of me. Uh, I have a comedian friend, John Cleese from Monty Python. And he always, when he, when he calls, he'll say, oh, you're still alive. You haven't killed yourself yet. I said, I haven't found that rope that's cheap enough. So give me time. <laughs> Uh, I have some students in some universities that are absolutely mind-blowingly good. And it's why I teach more than anything else that I do. I do lectures like this because I want to see Dublin. I love Ireland. I worked here 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, for RTE on, on the election. I have some students across the globe that will hopefully be allowed to save their country, their continent, and the world. The African Leadership University brings together over 40 countries in one place, there are about 1,500 students there, and they all work together. They all lift each other up. They're poor. They have limited resources. The university is an oasis of knowledge in a continent that is still at war with each other. The economies are growing. There's an entrepreneurial spirit that is uplifting. And the sense of community is truly inspiring, better than the US, better than here, better than the West. And it caused me to realize that it actually does take a village to raise a child. I ridiculed this. I made fun of this. I would say, no, it doesn't take a village. It takes two good parents. And now I realize I was wrong. So this is an example of acknowledging it. You take that university, which is in Mauritius and Rwanda, you take that university and apply it globally, and we can get over this because they're not woke and they aren't partisan and they aren't political because they're trying to survive. And we help them survive and we will deserve a place on this planet. And if they survive, they will thrive and they will bring peace and understanding and empathy to all of us. They give me hope, but not much else does. We have time for one last question. Hopefully, it's a hopeful one. Uh, no, I just did all my hope. I know, right? So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to circle back. I can do two minutes of hope. That's <laughs> yeah. all I got. We've got to know this is not a hopeful question. So, uh, Dara Lawler, a senior researcher here at the IIA, um, I'm wondering, and I'm interested in who you think might possibly be in the running to be uh, the vice presidential nominee uh, for president or for a presidential run for Donald Trump. And could you uh, possibly see, say, somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene on the ballot in that case? I, by the way, that microphone won't pick it up, but there were groans among <laughs> people sitting. <laughs> I could see Kerry Lake, who ran for governor in Arizona. I could see Christy Nome, who is the current governor of South Dakota. I believe Donald Trump will choose a woman. And... And it's gonna be very interesting to see who runs with him. I, I, I don't have a good answer because he doesn't have a good answer. I'm a pollster in addition to all the stuff that I do. So it's based on information. It's based on research. It's based on knowledge. There's nothing to indicate because it could be any person. It was not gonna be Mike Pence. It was gonna be Chris Christie at one point. But then Trump changed his mind. Now I just wonder, does he have one? That was a joke, by the way, that did not go over well. <laughs> I think that you all are so afraid of what could happen that, that nothing's funny about it. I don't know because whatever he's thinking now will not be what it is a year from now. 
And I think we'll have to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for, for joining us. And thank you to the, the way, audience. I would poll them to see sure. who's more depressed now. <laughs> I but thought I, you might turn it into a focus group. But uh, I'm not going to do that. So, uh, so thank you to, to people who joined in person and uh, the people who joined uh, on Zoom and, uh, and for you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.